Well, welcome this morning as we enter now our third week of our series on 2020 Vision. We began our series three weeks ago by investigating what it means to be blind, what it means to be spiritually blind, blind to the blessings of God and taking them for granted, blind to our own sin and the consequences of those sins, blind to the plan of God, blind to the plan of redemption, and willfully blind to the prophetic times in which we're living. Jesus had very harsh words for those that could read the signs of the weather, but not the signs of the time. He calls them hypocrites. He said, you're a bunch of actors. That's all you are. You act as though you're interested in the plan of God, but you really at heart have no interest at all. And Jesus uses that harsh term. He said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're stage actors. That's all. You're playing a role, and the role you're playing is you're interested in the things of God. But at heart, you are not. You're blind. Week two, we discuss what it's like to be spiritually nearsighted. A nearsighted individual is unable to see anything clearly unless it's relatively close to them. A nearsighted person lives in a very small world, therefore. Their world is only as small as, you know, their eyes can see and be nearsighted. They have a distance of about 10, maybe 12, or even 15 feet. And beyond that, everything else is blurred. Everything else is inconsequential. And so the nearsighted person lives in a very small world, a world that we discover that's made up of me, mine, and ours. We're self-centered. Everything that happens in life is only important if it involves me, my family, or my acquaintances. And the rest of the world, it continues to exist, of course, but it's fuzzy, it's out of focus, and therefore out of sight, and soon out of mind. We discovered that the big problem with being short-sighted is that short-sighted decisions have long-term ramifications. If you doubt that, just go to any prison and ask somebody there what decision they made in an instant that has now changed their lives or the lives of others forever. Or go to a drug addiction center and begin to ask those that are there for rehabilitation, what is it that you started on? Yes, we have discovered then that short-sighted decisions have long-term ramifications. Now, moving on this morning, we want to look at the opposite of what is nearsighted, and we want to carefully examine what it means to be spiritually farsighted. You know, farsighted individuals can see things clearly at a distance, while at the very same time, they may struggle with something only two feet away. It appears fuzzy, and it seems as though it's something they cannot really comprehend what it is. For example, a far-sighted person driving down a highway may clearly see a billboard that's off somewhere in the distance like maybe 100 yards or more, but is unable to clearly see the gauges on the dashboard that is in front of them. Therefore, they're driving down the road kind of oblivious. Yes, they don't know whether they're speeding or not. They do not know if they've got enough gas. They're not sure if the car is overheating or whether it's run out of oil or a tire gauge is stating that you know, you've got a flat. All of these things they're oblivious to. They can see down the road, and they can see down the road a long ways, but they can't even see the dashboard in front of them, nearsighted. So simply put, nearsighted people cannot see things that are at a distance, while farsighted people cannot see things that are close up. It's the kind of person that needs their glasses to find their glasses in the morning. I'll never forget the very first time that I realized, you know, how farsighted I had become. I was up at Spencer Lake, our camp, and during the midst of one of the services, all the lights went, all the power went out, and our superintendent at the time, uh, Larry Levy, said to me, he said, Jerry, said, can you go over and find out what's going on? And I went into a very small, very dark room where the uh, fuse boards were and switches and all of that for the campus there. And I started looking at them, and I, I came out and I said, I cannot see them. 
I cannot see whether or not the fuses are burned out or not, that little, you know, filament that's on the inside. And I begin to realize, you know, at about 40, I need a little bit of help. And so what do they call those glasses? They call them cheaters, don't they? We wear them so that we can see things now close up. So simply put then, the nearsighted persons, uh, they cannot see things that are at a distance. And those that are farsighted cannot see things that are close up. You know, the Jewish people that we read about in the scriptures, both Old Testament and New, there was kind of a mix of both. At times they were nearsighted, and at other times they were farsighted spiritually. The Old Testament records approximately 400 prophecies regarding Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. So if you were to go through, I have not personally done so, but if you were to personally go through the Bible, the Old Testament, and begin to count up all the times that it talks about Messiah coming, Messiah's life, the death that he would, you know, bear for all of us at Calvary, and on the third day of the resurrection, you would discover that there are about 400 different prophecies in the Old Testament about this. Now, God raised up at that season, at that time of world history, he raised up a whole class of ministers that are called in the Old Testament prophets, and other times they're called seers. I thought it's interesting that it uses the term a seer. A prophet or a seer could see what others could not see naturally. And then they would proclaim the things that they could see under the inspiration of God, even though they may be off in the future, many, many years, decades, and even thousands of years in some occasions. The prophets then, they could see what no one else could see. The prophets were far-sighted. Now remember, the downside of being far-sighted is the, the inability to see things when they're close up. When Jesus was born, we all know that account. We just celebrated Christmas just a little over a month ago. When Jesus was born, every detail was precise according to God's revealed plan in the Old Testament. He was born of a virgin, just as Isaiah tells us. He was born in Bethlehem, just as the prophet Micah tells us it would be. Herod's attempt to kill the children and to exterminate all in an attempt to find this Messiah and get rid of this newborn king of the Jews. The Bible tells us all of this in the Old Testament. The Bible also tells us that there will be a time when Jesus and his family would escape the danger of Jerusalem and especially that in the Bethlehem area, and they would go down south into Egypt. And so all of these are told, foretold in the Bible by prophets or what is called seers, people that could see off into the distance supernaturally with the power of God and the help of God. As long as Messiah's birth was far off, way off in the distance somewhere. Matter of fact, if you're to go back into the Bible, and I think we might agree that in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 3 and verse 15, it gives us the first glimpse of Messiah that was going to come. And Messiah, when he would come, he would take and crush the head of the serpent. So Jesus, Messiah, would come and destroy the works of the evil one, and one day ultimately destroy Satan and his cohorts in sin as well. So as long as Messiah's birth and the promises of his coming of Messiah was way off somewhere down in the distance, the far-sighted Jews, they could see it, and they would agree, and they would buy into it. But when Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, was actually born as, a virgin, in a, as you know, a virgin birth in Bethlehem, all the accounts of the Old Testament perfectly fulfilled, now it was too close, and the Jews couldn't see it or understand that Jesus was the Messiah. It was all too close and all too fuzzy. The Gospel of John, I believe, records it this way. In John chapter 1, verse 10 now, he was in the world. That is Jesus. Jesus was in the world, John writes. 
And though the world was made through him, the world did not what? Did not recognize him. The same ones, now these are the Jewish people that had received the law, had received the prophets, they had the seers, they had all of these promises spelled out to them by the prophets going all the way back to Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament. He was in the world, this one that was promised, Messiah, Jesus, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, that is the Jewish people. But his own, the Jewish people, did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. You see, the Jewish people were always looking, but never finding. The masses beheld the promised Messiah with their very own eyes, and yet when Jesus was born, because now he's not somewhere in the distance in prophecy, he is now on the world scene, he is right there, and the Bible says they did not recognize him. It was all a blur. The apostle Peter, you know, with all of his flaws, was one that was able to put all this together. And when I read about this man, many times he's the one that speaks up and, and he thinks a little later on, maybe that wasn't the wisest thing to say. Other times he steps out of the boat and he's, you know, he is an impetuous kind of guy. I love reading about Peter. He's my kind of guy, amen? And I think we all identify with him, both in his strengths, but also in some of his, you know, impetuous ways. But he is one that is able to take that which is projected way out many, many years and even several millennium before Jesus was born. He's the one that's able to put two and two together and understand that which was promised by the prophets and the seers of the Old Testament way off in the distance he is the one that is now the fulfillment of all of that. Listen to what it says, Matthew 16, starting with verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, now every time we go to Israel, and I've been there 20 some times, but every time we go to Israel, I always take our people over to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is an interesting place. There is a cave there at Caesarea Philippi, and they literally believed at this time that this was the entrance, this cave, to hell itself. And so at this cave, this is the place where they call the gates of hell. And so this place had a pagan aura behind it that, was, that is to this very day. It's a phenomenal sight because there you'll see all of these statuary to Pan. Now some of you probably remember the name Pan. A number of years ago, one of the world organizations, they had a special day set aside, World Day, where they dedicated again this world of ours, our earth, back to Pan. Let me tell you about Pan for a second. Pan was a god that was a head of a goat on the body of a man. Believed that he was the one that created the heavens and the earth, and they worshipped him there. So Jesus now is at this place that is noted as being the very gates of hell, Caesarea Philippi, where they worship Pan and say Pan is the one that gave us the earth, Pan is the one that watches over us, Pan this, that, and the other. And so now Jesus asks a question while he's there. When Jesus came to this region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street? What are they saying? What's the average person saying about who I am? Now, it's interesting. When you look at the responses here, and I want you to have this in mind as I read them in just a second. When you see the response, you'll notice that each and every one of these men are noted for living a supernatural life, that they made an impact upon their generation and that their lives were supernatural in some very unique and special way. And so he asked them, what, what are people saying about me? And he asked it once again, right outside the gates of hell. 
They replied, some say John the Baptist. Well, John at this point had already been beheaded. And so now they're beginning to wonder. This supernatural life that we saw in John the Baptist, we see in Jesus, is it possible? The spirit of John the Baptist is somehow residing and alive inside of this person that is called Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, some are saying it's John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, the one that went up in the chariot of fire to heaven. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who or what about you? Jesus now pauses. He says, so much for what the world is saying. The world is rather confused. They don't know who I am. Remember, they did not recognize him. We just read that a few moments ago. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Listen, who speaks up now? Simon Peter answered. He says, in so many words, I know who you are. You are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He said, you have received heaven's information about me. Others are confused. They're not sure who I am. They know that I live, you know, a supernatural life and that I live in relationship with my Father in heaven. However, they do not know who I am, and I'm right here. And the prophets, for hundreds and hundreds of years, were trying to tell you what to be watching for and what to look for. And now I'm here, and now it's so close. But because you're farsighted, you do not recognize me. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for you for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now again on the day of Pentecost, Peter is the one that matches prophecy with fulfillment. Listen to what it says. In Acts chapter 2 now, Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So now picture this in your mind. They're in this upper room, 120. They had gone there in obedience to Jesus. When Jesus said, I don't want you leaving Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they're there in the upper room, and suddenly there comes a sound, and it's like that of a violent wind. Verse 3 says, they saw what seemed to be tongues as a fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And in verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing what? Say it. Jews. Remember that because we're going to come back to that in a moment. And the Jews, remember, are primarily farsighted. When things are far away, they get it. But when it's right there standing in front of them, they cannot see it. It's all blurred to them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from where? Every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment. Remember these terms now. They came together in what? Say it. Bewilderment. Because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Next two words, utterly what? Amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Are they not from the region of Galilee? Go down to verse 12. Amazed and perplexed. Now notice how the crowd is. This Jewish crowd, they are amazed, they're bewildered, they're all of these things. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? They understood something supernatural is happening, possibly. We don't know what it is. Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine to drink or too much wine. Look at verse 14. 
Then Peter, here he is again. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, you should know what I know is what he's saying. You are part of the same commonwealth. We are brothers in faith. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure that that would work in Milwaukee. But nonetheless, he says, respectable persons are not drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. He says, it's only 9. So, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The crowd is confused, they're amazed, and all of this. But Peter, he puts two and two together. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will do what? They will prophesy. Let me ask you right now, parenthetically, are your sons and daughters prophesying? If not, they should be. Your young men will see what? How many young persons in the house? You can lie about that one. You usually do anyway, all right? In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And we won't ask who's the old men in the house, all right? Your old men will have what? They will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women. So the servants are not going to be left out. Men and women in the sight of God are both equally the same and both in line for the blessing of God. I will pour out of my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I love the situation here because it shows us what is happening in the minds of the Jewish people. The Jewish people, they hear the sound of heaven in the upper room. And they come down and they're amazed, they're perplexed, they don't know how to put all this together. Yet, if you go back in Scripture, you'll discover there that Joel had promised the outpouring of the Spirit 800 years before. And so the seer, the prophet Micah, and all of these that you look at going through the Scriptures, they're giving us insights of what it should be like when Messiah is literally here on the earth. And in this case, Jesus said, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high, and I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as orphans in this world. I will give you the Spirit when I return to the Father. The Father will send the Spirit upon you, and you're going to receive this gift from God. And this happens in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And they're still saying, ah, it's yet to come. It's still on the road a long, long ways. These guys are just a bunch of carousing drunks. Man, they have no respect for them. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're all talking out of their heads. I love the way the King James Version renders this verse about Peter catching on and telling them what this is all about. Peter rises up in the midst of it. And he says, this is that. Can you say that phrase with me? This is that. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is that. I can just see Peter. You know, they, they say that Peter was rather a short little guy. And, uh, you know, some of the, the vitality and the, you know, just the excitement of, of this little guy. He's, he's, you know, short in the crowd, but he gets up and I can just see him say, these men and women are drunk like you say they are. This is that. Friends, let me tell you, if there's ever a time in church history where the men and women of God need to be able to stand up and know the Scriptures and see it not only when it's far off, but to be able to declare, this is that. We are here. This is the moment. It's not down the road somewhere, lost 
in time, but it is here and it is upon us in this very moment. You see, the promise of the Spirit was in the womb of time for 800 years. And when it was birthed on the day of Pentecost, the far-sighted Jews that could only see things far away and could not see them when they had actually arisen and come up on the scene, they missed it all. Every prophetic promise in the Bible is backed by a God of precision. And God is methodically working behind the scenes to bring what he has promised to pass. And it's all going to happen, the Bible says, in due season. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 3 says this. Or rather, verse 37 and 36. For ye have indeed, you have need of patience. He said in the last days, he said there's going to be need for patience. How many feel at times your patience is running a little low? I think we've all, we sense that. And I'm not speaking about just naturally. You know, we all have things that we handle better than others. And we all have a natural propensity for a certain level of patience. But this is literally saying in the last days, you're going to have to practice patience in your life. There were some that were throwing in the towel, and they were saying, well, where is this promise of his return? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue on. It's like a big old circle, and the world just keeps on spinning, and uh, there's not any real change to it all. Listen to what he says. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet, how long? Say it, church. A little while. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. He said, so as you see the times and the seasons that were foretold of old by the prophets and the seers of the Old Testament, when you see all of this coming to pass, he said, I want you to have patience. Patience with one another. Patience with a different generation that does things differently. To have patience in this moment and not be uptight and, and demanding your own way in all things. Patient. Patient until the return of the Lord. And so he says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. For the just shall live by faith. Friends, we're living in an hour where the church of Jesus Christ desperately needs 2020 vision. We need to be far-sighted enough so that we can lock on to the promises when they're far off. But we need to be nearsighted enough so that we do not miss them when the fulfillment is right in front of our face. The Bible tells us that in the last days, just prior to the return of Christ, there will be certain signs. It said one of the signs is going to be kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. There's going to be pestilences. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be all of these things. We have the same tendency as the Jewish people, if we're not careful, to put all these things so far down the road that when they're staring us in the face and we're right at the moment, rather than standing up and saying to a generation that is confused and perplexed, this is that. All of these signs surround us, and we need to be far-sighted enough so that we can see them off in the distance, but near-sighted enough so that we don't miss their fulfillment like the Jewish people. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says this, looking unto Jesus. You know, that's a great place to look. Someone has said, if you look around, you become distressed. 
If you look within, you become depressed. If you look to him, you live at rest. Amen? That's a good way to live life. And so the author there of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus. Some of your translations say it this way. Let your eyes be fixed. Let your eyes be driven towards Jesus, fixed upon him. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now listen to this. Who for the joy that was set before him did what? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now let me tell you what this is saying. Jesus had the ability to look beyond the momentary. That which was just the nearsighted part of of his life here on this earth. He was able to look beyond rejection. He could look beyond being spat upon. He could look beyond confused disciples that one day were on and the next day off. He stayed true to his mission all the way through. He could see it. He could see where the mission was to come to seek and to save the lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. But there were some tough, tough, tough times in between. And the Bible says, when he was standing before Pilate, we can assume this from what we just read, assume it. That when Pilate was judging him and the bantering that was going on, I had been sent over to Herod, from Herod back to Pilate. And all of this, pain and pain of rejection and hearing the crowd say, away with him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, an insurrectionist, an immoral person, a murderer. We choose him. Our eyesight, we see in our present eyesight, we see Barabbas better than Jesus. He is taken away and he is flogged and beaten. Beaten to the point that even his closest friends and associates would not be able to identify him. Hauled from there to Calvary, carrying his own cross until he stumbles beneath it. One hand is nailed. The other hand is nailed. And they drive a large spike down through both of his ankles. And they set him up on this cross. And the crowd comes by, says, sure, if you're really the Messiah, come down from this cross. (laughs) Look at him. He can't even save himself. What kind of a Messiah would he be to trust in him? He can't save himself. How could he ever save us? And they wagged their heads. And Jesus could see beyond all of that. You know what he saw? As he was standing before Pilate, as he was nailed to that cross, he saw you. He saw you worshiping along with a choir a few moments ago. He said, you know, I can do this. I can do this because of the joy that was set before him. So glad that he loved us that much. And I'm so glad that when we struggle with our sight, He's right there to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to help us. Church, we need 2020 vision. We dare not be blind to the times or the seasons in which we live. We need to be farsighted enough so we can see what others cannot see. That's the people of God. 
the people of God see what others do not see. There was a time, I'm sure, that most of us in this room would have said, you know, I don't see what those people think Jesus' deal is all about. I mean, I just can't get into that. And they were either blind, farsighted, nearsighted. Something was blurring their vision. And you came into a relationship with Christ. And you said, wow. Suddenly your eyes are open. It's like somebody that just had cataract surgery. And that which was so fuzzy with the cataracts gone. You know, I just talked to somebody just two days ago that had gone through cataract surgery. And they said, it's amazing. I see the sun is brighter. The colors, I'm not sure where you found any color out there today. But said all the colors were more brilliant. Everything around me just is brilliant and shining. I pray that you too will have farsighted vision to be able to see what others cannot. But you'll have nearsight. You'll be able to see it when it's there. And that you'll be like Peter. You'll say, I may be short, but let me tell you something. This is that. This morning, if you're here and you've got a loved one that's got blurred vision, could be a family member, someone that's really struggling, they just don't see, they, don't, they cannot, these blinders almost over them. It's not necessarily that they're totally blind, but they're, they're nearsighted, they're farsighted. They, this, they cannot see what God wants them to see. I believe as we pray for them, God's going to begin to open eyes. And if you're in the house today and you say, you know, I've been kind of stumbling around lately. I don't know whether it's some cataracts spiritually. I'm not sure if I need corrective glasses or contact lens or something. I'm just not seeing things the way I know I ought to be. If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. While he was on the cross, he saw you, and he died for you. And on the third day, he rose again for you. And one day, he's coming back for you. And if you're not sure, and it's all kind of fuzzy, I'd love to pray for all of you this morning that they're saying, I've got a loved one that's got spiritual cataracts or something. They need, they need to see. I want you to like you're bringing them. And we're just going to fill in this altar. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to go home. But I want this moment to be life-changing for every person that's in the house. And I want God to begin to do something special in the lives of those that they cannot see. There's something there. It's all blurred. I want you to come as they begin to sing. I want to pray for you and pray with you just before we depart today. You come.